Well, if you are there, we we're in Ephesians. We're, today we're going we're gonna to continue kind of this idea, this long paragraph that Paul started in verse number 3 and going all the way down to verse 14. But there's a lot there. And uh, so today we're going to continue the second part of embracing our spiritual blessings. Embracing our spiritual blessings. And, and I thank Pastor Miller for uh, reading the text of Scripture this morning, beginning in verse number 8. Last week we uncovered, sought to dig deeper into the reality of the blessings that we have in Christ. And, um, you know, as you study this passage, and I promise as we go through this passage today, we are not uh, exhausting all that is taught in these passages. Uh, we're just really skimming the, skimming the surface. But my prayer is that these truths would begin to resonate and, and dig deep into our hearts and be reminded of who we are in Christ. That beautiful phrase, to be in Christ. For Christ to be in us, to be united with Christ. Last week we saw that we've been chosen. God chose us, but he didn't just choose us to simply reside in heaven. No, he adopted us. He chose us to adoption. We are now sons and daughters of God. We talked about in our small group how it's easy sometimes for us to wrap our mind around or seek to wrap our mind around some of the titles we give ourselves. We often say we are servants of Christ, and we are. We should serve the Lord out of a love because of all that God has done for us. Our lives should be a willing sacrifice to God. But sometimes it's easier for me to rest in that truth that I need to serve God rather than I am a loved, adored child of God, that I'm a son, I'm a daughter, I'm a joint heir with Jesus. We saw that we are accepted, perfectly, 100% accepted, not because of what we've done, but what Christ has done for us on the cross, and that we've been redeemed. That truth that our sins have been forgiven, that all of our sins, past, present, and future sins, have been wiped away by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, by His grace, gives us great confidence as we seek to walk in that truth. Today we continue on, and in verse number 8, he begins to un help us understand this wonderful and amazing blessing that we have as God's children. And I don't want you to miss this. It's that God's wisdom guides us. We are guided by the wisdom and knowledge of God. What does it say in verse number? It says, it says, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. I, I love the fact that Ephesians uses this extravagant blessing throughout the book. Speaking of God's grace, it's not, it's not meager or small or measured grace. No, it's abounding grace. It is abounding wisdom. He's made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure with the, which he hath purposed in himself. What is this passage telling us? This passage is telling us that God has given to us as his children an understanding from him. I think sometimes as Christians we take this for granted. You know why? We are so blessed in the world that we live in today to have access to God's completed word. Have you ever stopped to think about the fact that God, the creator of the universe, the one who spoke the universe into existence, the one that holds everything by the power of his word, chose to speak to us? God chose to, to speak to us. God chose to reveal himself to us. He did not just leave us in this world to seek to find or to, the, uh, to, to try to discover this mysterious will. No, he's revealed to us the mystery of his will. He's revealed to us his wisdom, and he's given us wisdom that guides our life. Sometimes we take for granted the truths that we see in Scripture. But have you ever had a passage of Scripture hit you in such a way that radically changed the way that you understood life. We always call, we call these a paradigm shift, all right? You see something one way, and then you hear the truth, or you, it's revealed to you, and you're like, whoa. It's like when a magician reveals how a magic trick is done, okay? 
I am the kind of person, I don't want to know how the magic trick is done. I like being odd, you know, the sleight of hand. I'm like, that's amazing. That's magic. And they're like, actually, I just did this, this, and it's like, oh, okay, well, all right. Not as cool. But have you ever stopped to think that God has given us insight into this life that we live? Um, there's a verse in the Bible. I often go back to this one as an example, mainly because it, the way it changed my life in my younger Christian life in such a profound way. But it does not come from worldly wisdom because the Bible talks about wisdom that's of this world and then it talks about God's wisdom, the wisdom that comes from above. It's peaceable. It's, 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 uh, it's pure. But the wisdom of this world is fleshly. It's going to lead us almost, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But there's a verse in the Word of God that made such an impact in my life as a young Christian that was one of these paradigm shifts. And I want to give you this verse. I'll give you kind of a little background why. And I'll share a few other verses. Why it's so important for us to remember as God's children, we get to understand the wisdom of God and He guides us in our life. Don't take that for granted. Psalm 15, verse 1 says this, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous, that idea is of harsh or sharp, angry words, but grievous words stir up anger. You know, in the home I grew up in, there was a lot of hatred, a lot of anger, a lot of fighting. And it seemed like in order to get your way or for things to change, you just, you, you just yell, okay? Like, the more you yell... And for some reason, we kind of feel like the more we yell, the more we fight, things are just going to get fixed later, right? And that doesn't work that way. And there's, there's so much, you know, uh, uh, fighting and, and this, this, like, turmoil. I remember when I read this verse and sought to apply it in my life, it was like, whoa, this is like a life hack. You know, somebody's coming at you all hot and bothered. You know that feeling. And you give them a spirit-filled, soft answer. It's amazing. They're almost like triple. Oh, you know, no, 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 no. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry. I, I should. I'm, I'm not kind of reacting. You know, I, 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 I. you're like, whoa. But what does the world say? Hey, you stick up for number one. Sure. You take care of yourself. The the fact that God has given us wisdom. To navigate this world is a blessing beyond our comprehension. This world lives in absolute darkness. There's no peace. There's no joy in this world. But what Jesus offers us in Christ is he guides, he gives us an abundance of his wisdom and understanding. Think of the verse that we are familiar with. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to your own understanding and in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct you your paths. What does the world say? Follow your heart. Listen, you know, uh, uh, trust yourself. Speak your truth. You know what the Bible says? No. If you want the God of the universe to direct your life, trust him. Lean on him. Acknowledge him. Depend upon him. He'll direct our path. But what does the world say? No, I want to make, I did it my way. I want to make my own path for my life. But we know that the, the way of transgressors is hard. We know that that path leads to destruction. The fact that God has given us this beautiful understanding. It's funny, Pastor Miller actually quoted this verse. I have it in my notes, Mark chapter 10. The world says, hey, um, if you want to be in leadership, you need to have power. You need to have uh, people look up to you and serve you. But Jesus says, no, it's not going to be this way among you. Because whoever's going to be greatest among you shall be your minister, your servant. And whosoever you will be, the chiefest shall be the servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered, but to minister, not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The blessing that we have in Christ is that the, the grace of God radically changes the way that we view the world from what the world has to offer to what the wisdom that comes from above, which comes from God. The question is, are we tapping into that wisdom? Are we living in light of that wisdom? You see, the world, what the world offers is a false sense of security based on temporal and unstable foundations. You know what these temporal, un, uh, the unstable foundations are? 
If you're going to be successful in this world, if you're going to really make it in this world, wealth, power, personal achievement, fame, all of these things that we pursue after are so temporal. They're so fickle. And yet God says, no, I have something far greater, the glory of Christ, that you would live as light in this world as we're going to talk about. These goals that the world has to, us to offer are so superficial. I'm reminded of this. Um, how many of you have ever uh, done, as, a, as your job or your profession, worked in a job that required sales for commission? Anybody done sales for commission? Okay, there's a few of us, all right? In college, I worked for a company, a little on the shady side, they were a blinds company. Okay. <laughs> In fairness, though, they were kind of shady. Um, uh, it was called Factory Direct Window Coverings. They are no longer in business. Shocker. Um, but uh, I needed a job, and uh, they provided a job for me. And my job was to sell window coverings, blinds and shades. And, um, and if, you, if you hit the, if, if you have um, the, uh, um, goodness, I sold them for so many years. You know, the uh, those, what, shutters. Goodness, thank you. Thank you, Charity. I, if you could sell shutters. That was like the jackpot. If, if, you, if you found somebody um, dumb and I mean, uh, <laughs> eager enough to spend tens of thousands of dollars on custom made shutters for their windows, man, you are, this is great. It's, you, payday is coming. But if you've ever worked in sales, if you ever worked in sales, um, you know that feeling of you're connecting with the customer and they're excited about your product and you're about to make the sale and you make that sale and then, you know, like any normal human being, you're computing your commission rate as you're getting that sale and you're thinking, oh my goodness, this is gonna be awesome, all right? And you get the sale, you finish the sale, you get your commission check. You know what happens after that? It all starts over, all over again. <laughs> I don't care how, if you're, if you're, if you're in commissions and that's a, that's a hard profession. That's a, that's a, that's a never ending. That's a hard job. Okay. I don't think I'm bent for it for, for in my life, but you have the most amazing month, right? The next month you have to do it again and again and again and again. It's never enough. It's never enough. Your boss is going to be like, Hey, that's last month, the month. Now you got to go back out and sell those blinds. Thank God I was able to leave that behind me. The world, all the things that the world has us grasping for are so temporal and so you get them and you're like, what now? You, you say, well, if I had this, it's just going to make me happy. You know, if I, if I could uh, have the bigger house, you get the bigger house, you realize, oh, it's, it's more work to take care of this bigger house. You, you buy the expensive car and then the car breaks down. You're like, well, that's more expensive to take care of the expensive car. All these things. It's never ending. And the blessing that we have in Christ is he gives us the wisdom that, that is, that is life giving. It's a life that is, is to the glory of God. And it's, it doesn't give us this temporal satisfaction. It's an eternal reward that we have. The second blessing he lets us see in this passage. And I think it's so important as Christians is in, in Christ, in Christ, all things are made new. Don't miss this in verse number 10, verse number 10 of our, of our scripture says this, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time. So in other words, in God's perfect timing, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. There's a lot going on there, okay? What is Paul trying to say here? Paul is saying because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross and the resurrection, God is in the process through Christ of making all things new. This is such an important uh, point in our life because we sometimes miss this. We sometimes think that in Christ we have, yes, we have our salvation taken care of, all is good. No, God is in the process of making all things new. When, when Adam and Eve 
ultimately, as our representatives, sinned in the Garden of Eden, the Bible says that death passed upon all men. Now we have this sin nature. Not only that, not just humankind was broken, creation was broken. Romans says that all of creation groans for the redemption. The entire world is longing for the time when all things will be made new. But the wonderful part about this truth is this is an already not yet situation. In Christ, we already have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. But right now, we're walking the valley. We're sometimes going through difficult times. We have to be reminded of our heavenly home. In Christ, all things are being made new. But this is beautiful. We get to be partakers in this redemptive process. We begin to be part of this. Listen to what he says. He says, we've, he says, in the dispensation, God is bringing all things together. Heavenly realm, physical realm. The spiritual realm and the physical realm are going to be reunited in the new heavens and the new earth. Do I know how all that's going to work? I don't. But I can know this. Jesus said that we need to pray. What does it say? Pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, every time we seek to love, to, to serve, to do good, we are bringing the kingdom of God to this earth and asking that Christ would have full and 100% dominion and reign on this earth. Why? So that we could glorify God. That's what it says. It says we've obtained this inheritance, okay? This, this future inheritance that we're going to get, being predestined to the purpose of him which worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. This verse is like a, a, a picture of what we hear in Jesus' words. I actually preached this text in the, in the graduation. To let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The wonderful truth as a Christian is we have the opportunity to be part of this remaking, renewing of the world around us. Every time we seek to do good. We are praying that God's kingdom would come to this earth, that God's reign would come to this earth. What does this mean in our own personal lives? The Bible says, if therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The idea there is in the moment of salvation, we are 100% perfectly right with God positionally. But then as the process of that, it begins to change step by step through our sanctification, that we become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we living this reality out in our life? Are we holding on to the truth that God has changed our life? You know, outside of Christ, our whole life is a life of shame, guilt, hiding, but in Christ, now that everything has been made new and God, the, the blood of Jesus Christ covers all of our sins— we no longer have to do superficial fixes on our life. We can go as deep knowing that God's grace will always be great enough no matter what sin we uncover in our hearts. This is the truth, okay? Um, sometimes, have you, ever, um, have you ever done a project? Uh, I'm not a handyman by any stretch of the imagination. I know it comes as a shock to most of you. You probably had me on your speed dial. You have me in your phone. Pastor Joel, handyman, okay? Um, shocker, I'm not. To, to, uh, to my wife's dismay, she probably wishes I was a little better at, uh, at fixing things. But um, have you ever found yourself that there'd be a problem with uh, perhaps, I'm not great with cars either, so if, uh, you know, if I, I, you're out there asking, what is this guy good at, okay? That's the wrong question. I, I can feel it, all right? Some of you are like, why, what, why, what, why did we hire this guy? What does he know? What does he do? What, what can you do, all right? I ask that myself all the time, all right? <laughs> calm down, people. Calm down. Have you ever looked at a task and thought to yourself, ooh, this is going to be a problem? Yeah. Um, perhaps uh, you see uh, there's, some, there's some termite damage. It's a little close to home. We actually had to, had to treat some termites in the, in the ministry building. I was like, not, not after we got it all fixed up, you know? And, uh, and the guy's like, hey, I just want you to know, this, uh, this entire wall has been completely destroyed uh, by termites. We're going to have to tear everything apart and everything. And you're like, what about a new paint job? <laughs> I mean, like, I'm, we're, I'm, we're talking the good stuff. Not like the cheap stuff. I'm like, the really, like, if we were just to give a good coat of paint on this, is that, uh, that going to be sufficient, right? 
Well, we would know that that's not going to fix the problem that's when inside. This is the beautiful thing about Jesus making all things new, okay? God is so good and loves us so much that he knows the deep crevices of our hearts, and we don't have to hide anything from him, and that God is working to renew every aspect of our life. You know this to be true because there's sins in your life that you're like, I'm taking this to my grave. I mean, I, this, is, this, is, this is with me forever, right? God has come to give you life and life more abundantly, and God has come to free you from the bondage of that sin. Not to put the, the coat of paint over your, over your life. There were a, a group of people in the New Testament that kind of tried to do this. They were whited sepulchers. They were rotten on the inside, but they just tried to make everything look good on the outside. Because Jesus is making all things new, there's nothing we can, nothing we, we should not hide anything from him. I'll be honest with you. I don't want to know what kind of problems there are in my home, okay? Like if, if somebody came to me and said, I just want you to know you got termite damage, this, that, I'm like, no, I want to know. <laughs> more problems, more money, all the fixing, all the things, okay? Just put a band-aid on it, right? But that's a horrible approach to life in your home, too. Just want to say that. But it's a horrible approach to your Christian life. Because the world says, hey, you got this. You don't, no, don't worry about this. You'll, you'll, it'll all work out. Time will heal. No. Don't be afraid to open up our hearts to the Lord and say, God, I need you to make me new so that I can be part of this glorifying process that I would be to the praise of your glory who's trusted in Christ. You see, it's not just your life that's hurt when we don't open it up to God. It's others' lives that you're able to influence. Often the sin, the the struggles that we go through in our lives are used as a vehicle to help others. Imagine, I'm just going to give you a little, um, just a, a thought process, okay? What if all of us hide our sin? Imagine. All of us as Christians, we hide ourselves. We come to church, hey, bless the Lord, life is good, you know. Marriage is great, kids are perfect, life is good. Everything's great, no sin whatsoever. Who's that going to help? What if I say to you, hey, you know, God has really been working in my life in this area. And uh, quite honestly, I, I, need, I need prayer that I would be freed from this you know what my other brother in Christ is going to be thinking? How dare he? No, he's going to be, oh, wow, I, you know, that's, that's an area I need to work on. God is making all things new. Why? That we could be to the praise of his glory. We're to be vehicles of God's praise and glory. And he's making all, not some, all things new in Christ. The last and most glorious truth that we find in this passage of Scripture such an important passage, such an important point, is our inter- eternal inheritance is secured. It has been sealed. It is forever settled in heaven. Listen to what verse number uh, 13 says. In whom also, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel, the good news of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed unto, uh, with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption, the purchase of our purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. This is such a marvelous and beautiful truth, and it's so important for Christians to understand this truth, that when we believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we put our faith and trust in Christ, in Christ alone, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the good news of our salvation, we are given a earnest, a promise of our inheritance, and that is the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God seals us unto the day of redemption. In other words, the Holy Spirit of God seals us eternally secure and will begin this process of sanctification until the day we are ultimately glorified with God. 
1 Peter chapter 1 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy has begotten us. That means born us, birthed us again. We are born again unto a lively hope. Now we think of the word hope in our day and age, like I really hope I can, you know, hope everything works out. No, it's a strong confidence that we have because of the resurrection from the dead of the Lord Jesus Christ to an inheritance, listen to this, incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Romans chapter 8 verse 16 says this, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be also glorified together. We are in Christ, joint heirs with Christ. And this seal is eternal. And it gives us great confidence. You see, the thing is, is that the idea of we are sealed, okay, the Holy Spirit is our uh, earnest of our inheritance. It goes back to ancient times where kings would have a ring, and on that ring there would be a a signet, and they would uh, place their ring, uh, they would put down down some uh, melted wax on on a document, and then the king would use that seal and press it in. Personally, I think we need to bring that back. Like, how cool would that be? Like, if my kids are like, hey, Dad, can we get a, can we get an allowance? I'm like, come over here with your document and I'm like deny no uh, it's like seal you know the power that you know all of us want that ring we want that ring that signet but what what came with that seal was authority ownership and protection but it goes far beyond any earthly king when the king of kings and lord of lords says your inheritance is forever we can rest in that if we are in Christ nothing can separate us from the love of God Nothing, no temptation, tribulation, persecution, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Pastor Miller was talking to me about something that really was such a great point. Uh, He was preaching on or teaching on in Bible class at our school at the end of the year on eternal security. Now, I want us to, I'm, we're going to touch on it just a little bit. And I'm going to give you like the, the idea of eternal security and some of the, some of the, some of the uh, problems that people see with that. And they say, well, if this is, listen, when you are in Christ, Okay, when we are born again as a child of God, it's a one-time thing. Okay? You're born once in the flesh, born once in the Spirit. We are sealed unto the day of redemption. In other words, that promise, that, that, that inheritance that we have, that purchase of possession will not go away. And nothing, you or me, can separate ourselves from the love of God. He holds on to us. It is not me holding on to him. It is God holding on to me until the day of redemption. Of redemption. That is the truth of eternal security. Okay. But sometimes people say, well, you know, I, somebody, I know somebody that made a profession of faith and their life is living like that. There's no confidence in a life that makes a profession of faith and lives apart from God for years and years and years and has no repentance, no remorse. No, there's no pulling of the Holy Spirit. There's no confidence in that person's salvation. But when somebody is truly saved and they truly put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, God begins to begin to work in them. He says to the, the one that began a good work will perform it. In other words, he begins this sanctifying process in our life to the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe because the Bible clearly states that once you are truly saved, you will always be saved. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Well, some people say, well, you know, if that means I can just, you know, say a prayer. By the way, there's nowhere in the Bible that says to be saved, you say a prayer. Okay, we put our faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone. It's a dependence. It's a reliance. It's saying, Jesus, do for me what I cannot do for myself. I, I, I turn to you, Father, as my, my redemption. They say, well, they say a, a, a prayer and then their life, just, they just do whatever they want. And some people have taken that and erroneously taught that they lose their salvation. In other words, if you do X amount of sin, you lose your salvation, and then you have to get it back. Pastor Miller asked the class, I thought this was wonderful, I'm going to use your illustration, Pastor Miller, if you'll allow me. I'm not even asking him, I'm just going to do it. Is that right? He said, okay, how many times do you have to sin in order to lose your salvation? Good question. 
I'll be honest with you. You murder one person, that's, a, that's kind of a bad deal, right? You would imagine. You're probably going to go to jail. They don't, they don't like, oh, is this your first murder? Oh, man, no problem. Second or third. What about a lie? I mean, how many times do you have to, if, if, how many times do we have to sin to lose our salvation? Well, you say it's not in the Bible. Well, it's not in the Bible because you can't lose your salvation. Okay, let's just imagine it's, I don't know, give an arbitrary number. Say it's 10. You do the 10 times, boom, you're out, okay? Pastor Miller asked this. He says, how do you get back in? And all of them came to the conclusion, it's like, well, at that point, you need to, you know, really, really say sorry for your sins and, and, uh, and, and really start living for God and, and put, you know, go back in. Every single one of those ways ends up being works. Think of the logic here. You're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. It is all of God. And God, who is infinite in adopting you from the foundation of the world. Like, do you, how ignorant is it to claim that God, who planned this, chose this, adopted us in himself, okay, before the foundations of the world, and we have the power to make it null and void after five sins? Like, do we, think about that. And then, how, how ridiculous it is for us to say, how do we get back in? <laughs> I'll be honest with you. If I lost my salvation, I'd want to know how to get back in. Well, you got to start living life. you got to start doing right. you got to start reading your Bible and praying. you got to do all... Well, what does that amount to? It amounts to work salvation. In other words, you're, you're saved by grace, but this, this grace is like kind of okay. All right? And then, you know, you mess up too many times, you're out. In order to get back in, you gotta, you got to show yourself, you got to be serious, right? That is not taught anywhere in Scripture. Why? <laughs> because this inheritance is not our own. It is given to us. It is gifted to us through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I will say this. As a child of God, God begins to change us to become more like his son. That our lives are not perfect. We sin, we fall, we fall, we fall seven times again and again and again, but we rise up again and, and we seek to, to honor and please the Lord. And, and as a Christian is not going to live in sin and feel comfortable in sinning. That, that conviction of the Holy Spirit is a gift that God gives to his children. The fact that we know right and wrong is a beautiful gift. The world doesn't know that. The world calls good evil and evil good all the time. They dedicate this month for, um, for, for uh, sin and wickedness. I mean, think about that. That's what the world says. We're like, we're going to take pride in this. No. That is an abomination in the sight of God. The world says what is good. But the fact that God gives us this understanding, God is going to yearn us. God is going to draw us. God is going to pursue after us. So a Christian is not going to just live in sin openly, freely, and have no uh, desire for him and, and be confident that their eternal security is secure. There is a lot of scripture in the Bible. First John's a great place to start if you're struggling with that. But I'll say this. If you put your faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone, believing that Jesus Christ died for your sins, according to the scripture, three days later rose from the grave, and you trust in him, relying on him, asking him to save you, the Bible promises that you will be, that's what it says, in whom you trusted after you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. It was trust, faith, belief. You've been sealed, and you've been sealed into the day of redemption. Christian, what does this do? It gives us assurance, hope, confidence, and it wipes away all insecurity and fear. Um, you know, there are some really bad examples of inheritance that are in the earthly world, okay? We know this. Uh, we know that there are parents who use their inheritance as a manipulation tactic, okay? You hear of stories, I've heard of stories, I know people that have changed their uh, wills like on a regular basis. Like their lawyer knows they got them on speed dial. So, hey, <laughs> Billy is out. <laughs> 
Jane is in, all right? We're kicking. And they will use that as a, as a tool to be like, well, we're going to write you out. You know, you're not going to get anything when we die. You're, you're not going to. What does that do to a child? It's insecurity and this uneasiness in the relationship. No. To know that we are eternally and forever secured because of what Christ has done and it's nothing we can do. We've been sealed. That gives us liberty and freedom. Okay, I want to press into this because I think it's so important. If I believe that my salvation is 100% to start with God, but it is up to my responsibility to keep it, how open am I going to be about my sin? Like, be honest. Like, if I believe that if I, to get to Christ, I have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but if in order to, to stay saved, it's all relying upon me, how open am I going to be about confessing my sins one to another and praying for one another? No, I'm not. Matter of fact, I'm not even gonna, not just going to be honest with you. I'm not going to be honest with me. I'm going to self-justify. I'm like, I'm doing really good. I'm doing okay. I'm, fig- I'm filling all these boxes. But if I'm eternally secure in my relationship with Christ, that means when I blow it, when I do something wrong, I can humbly confess that before God, seek reconciliation. I can be brutally honest with any of my brothers and sisters in Christ and say, I'm not perfect. I struggle with sin. I struggle with anger. I struggle with fear. I struggle with anxiety. I struggle, as a pastor, I struggle with all sorts of things. But the blood of Christ frees me, frees me from being, holding everything in, 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 in fear and anxiety. Christian, we have been given the wisdom and understanding of God. We have been given this beautiful unification plan to make all things new. We're part of that plan. And we have been blessed with the eternal inheritance in Christ. Are we living like it? Are we living like children who are overwhelmingly wealthy in Christ? Or are we living like we are destitute and having nothing? Can I encourage you this week, for the rest of our lives, seek the wisdom of God. Ask God for his wisdom. Promote unity. Seek ways to to bring about, through God's grace, heaven to this earth. Pray that God's kingdom would come, that his will would be done on this earth and live on this earth with the eternal security that you have been sealed unto the day of redemption because our eternity, our eternal inheritance is secured, forever settled in heaven. Let's pray. Father in heaven,